Many natural history museums across the world have extensive insect collections, and more and more of these museums have virtual components of the collections that can be accessed online. Why are insect collections preserved in museums, and how are they collected? And why are these collections important? Let's talk to a few professional entomologists and museum curators who will tell us more about insect collections in museums. First, let's hear a bit about our local insect collection from Danny Spiele, Assistant Curator at the University of Alberta's Strickland Entomology Museum. The collection here has over one million specimens. Most uh, insect groups are represented. There are some groups, however, that we do not have specimens of. But overall, it is a quite a large and well-represented collection. The museum is named after Colonel Edgar Harold Strickland, who was the first professor of entomology here at the University of Alberta when the Department of Entomology was founded in 1922. He served in both World War I and World War II and that was where he attained the rank of colonel. So they can get pins. Uh, there are reference books that show where and how to pin insects. Uh, the main thing that we try to get across to any of these budding entomologists is labeling of specimens. Uh, if a specimen is not labeled, it has no real scientific value other than being an example of that particular species. Uh, most specimens that are in the collection here have been collected by individuals. Uh, in our database we have over 3,000 individuals that have contributed to this collection. So at the same time, staff, myself as assistant curator, I do a lot of collecting, uh, graduate students, uh, amateurs, these are all people that collect and add material to the collection. Additionally, we do accept donations of specimens. So we have accepted uh, a donation, for example, of over 45,000 specimens. Uh, at one time, there was another that had over 26,000 specimens. One other one that was 38,000. With the initial, the, the initial scope of the collection is to have a lot of material from Western Canada. The, the major users here at the University of Alberta would be uh, the, the curator, the assistant curator being myself, uh, graduate students, uh, other researchers here on campus. But at the same time, we do lend material. So loans go out to other researchers at other universities and to graduate students, uh, basically worldwide. We have loans that have gone out uh, all over. Uh, managing an insect collection is ra a lot of work at certain times of the year. Initially, once this material is curated and sorted, put into the collection, it doesn't require a lot of care. The nice thing about living where we do here in Edmonton, the climate is rather dry, so we do not have to worry about uh, special climate controls. For example, in places where they have high hum humidity, they are always working to try and maintain that humidity, bring it down to a constant level so that you don't have issues with your specimens. The, the collection here is probably fairly comparable to most any other collection in the sense of the types of materials it has. However, because our former curator, uh, emeritus curator George Ball, his interest was in ground beetles, so we have an extremely good ground beetle collection. Our Mexican component of that is probably one of the best in the world. Felix Berling, who is our current curator, is very interested in Lepidoptera. So over time, that part of our collection has grown markedly. 
it's uh, it is an interesting point when people do come here and see the collection for the first time. I think the most uh, thing that they find surprising is the number of different specimens that we have here. Uh, it is quite a diverse collection. I have two that I would like to uh, mention. First of all, there is the genus Mormolaisi, and it's a carabid. It's called a violin beetle, and it sort of looks like a fiddle or a violin. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful uh, beetle with expanded uh, elytra, and this thing here comes from Indonesia and Malaysia. It's actually uh, found with bracket fungi and so on. So it's, uh, but as I say, very unique in its uh, basically habitus. The, per, the second specimen that I would like to mention is the genus Proculus. It's a, it's a basalid. It's one which I collected in Guatemala when we were there, and I managed to dig, dig, dig it out of a rotten log, and that was where I found it. So it's a, it's a large, beautiful specimen. We also spoke with Peter Hewley, the curator of the Bug Gallery at the Royal Alberta Museum. This gallery harbors one of the largest live insect collections in North America. Let's hear about the bug gallery and what it's like to care for so many different arthropods. My name is Peter Hewley. I'm the live animals supervisor here at the Royal Alberta Museum. Our mission is to try to uh, improve people's attitudes, to foster tolerance, respect, and appreciation for the invertebrates, the little things that run the world. Um, typically, these organisms are somewhat maligned and unpopular, um, and really they are the most integral, important, and abundant portion of any kind of ecosystem. So having a bad attitude towards bugs, if you will, is, is sort of, a, I like to think about it as ecological blasphemy. You're at the top of the food chain, and you're disrespecting everything that keeps you well fed. So trying to foster that tolerance tolerance, appreciation, and respect, and hopefully you walk out of here with a, a better understanding of the roles they play, and uh, certainly walk out realizing that these creatures are worth more alive than they are stuck to the bottom of your shoe. I think there are a few of our arthropods that people are, are drawn to. Um, we have some maybe bread and butter critters that are sort of always been favorites that get handled and that uh, people might have met in outreach or, uh, or when they you know, had a school group that came through the bug room. So things like the Mexican red knee tarantula, um, the Maclay specter stick insects, uh, the African giant millipedes, um, and then honestly, one of the biggest additions that I'm really excited about is our peacock mantis shrimp. I think being able to show those guys off is really, really neat. They're something that there's, there's a lot of information out there on them. And I worked very hard to try to, um, you know, celebrate those, those characters that they have, but also try to paint a little bit more of a softened picture of them. When you hear about something that can, you know, wind up and go from zero to 82 kilometers an hour in a punch in two milliseconds, and that has the broadest color vision of any animal in the animal kingdom, there did seem to be a little bit of, oh, these are guys are murderous smashing machines and and I feel like that's kind of a mischaracterization so hopefully we've provided enough information for people to see oh wait a minute they mate for life they look after their young you know they live for 20 years they can perceive phases of the moon maybe they're not such monsters after all maybe it makes sense that they have this crazy color vision and pack a wallop so so that again with the trying to change people's attitudes and and, uh, and soften that view a little bit A number of the invertebrates that we keep could be considered dangerous. Um, things like our Mexican black widow and Western black widow, as far as you know, venom potency, do pack a, a bit of a punch. Nobody in North America has died from a black widow bite in 30 years. So it's not as though just because they're venomous, you are going to die if you get bit by them. Um, and they're also relatively um, timid or docile species that if something your size, a thousand times their size, starts poking around in their web, they're just running out the back door. They're not coming out to fight. Um, our velvet ants uh, have a pretty decent sting as well. But again, it kind of requires some amount of mishandling. So most of this just comes down to training the staff and making sure that we treat things with respect or potentially use a container rather than your thumb and forefinger. So we have a very dedicated team. We've got five staff members and upwards of 20 volunteers that help us feed this stuff. And that's really one of the only ways that we can make sure that this many mouths of this many varieties are all looked after. Um, but certainly, you know, understanding what those requirements are is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, it's a lot of different stuff and understanding what they require. What do you have to feed them? What do they need for seasonal changes? That's a big thing with our, our native species is do you provide them with a the winter? We now have growth chambers that we can run at high temperature and at low temperature. 
So that's a big part of it. In order to keep, we keep all these live things, and it's a fair amount of work to keep these guys all very healthy and happy, but the part, whole purpose of keeping them in a museum setting is to teach people about them. And so there are a lot of visitors that come and, and check this stuff out, but we also make sure that we go out to schools, we go out to sort of nature and animal-themed events around the city. Uh, in some cases, too, some of the smaller communities around Alberta don't really have enough, this, you know, the public uh, school in Bonacord might not have enough money to put all the kids on a bus and send them to, to the city. So by coming out with a, with a few animals, we can kind of make sure that they still get that experience. So the outreach, um, inreach as well, where we have like, uh, you know, programs that are running here in the building that are sort of pre predetermined and at a particular time, we're looking to try to beef that up as well and make sure that there are, uh, you know, public interpreters and the education staff are, are competent in handling these sorts of things and confident doing it. Um, so we're going to try to make sure that that's, you know, it's not just a matter, you should have a lot of fun coming through the gallery on your own, but there's also opportunities to take stuff out, have a little actual up close personal hands on experience with that sort of thing. And so that is a big part of it. I go out to schools, um, I go out to these events, you pack a up a bunch of bugs. In the winter, you might want to put them in a cooler with a warm water bottle. But generally, yeah, we're making sure that we go and share those things outside of our building as well as inside. What's my favorite, my favorite invertebrate? You know, I have a stock answer for this. And it was if you have brothers and sisters, and you ask your parents who the favorite is, they won't tell you. They might actually have one, but they're not going to tell you, hopefully. Hopefully you have a good enough relationship with your parents that they're just, no, I love all my children equally. I think they're all really amazing for their own reasons. Um, but honestly, I'm really excited that we've got the peacock mantis shrimp out. I think, again, like I talked about, that it's something that has, it's somewhat famous for its punching ability and its crazy color vision. As you can see, insect collections can be a great way to engage learners and provide opportunities for outreach with the general public. Arguably, one of the most important functions of insect collections is that they can contain a lot of important information, if you know what you're looking for. The Strickland Entomology Museum's curator, Dr. Felix Sperling, has provided us with some insight on the use of insect collections in the scientific community. Insect collections are fantastic places for actually keeping the, the, the physical evidence that something was done. And it's great for vouchers, which are the physical evidence that allows you to go back and make sure about the identity of the species that the researcher thought it was. They're also a really good way of um, giving you all kinds of options for future work. Like you can break off a leg later and get DNA out of it, or do dissections and look at muscles and, and, and sclerites that nobody had any clue about before. Uh, they, they're a, a, a kind of a time capsule uh, that allows you to go back in uh, to see what was there in places that don't exist anymore. Anything, uh, including morphology, genetics, um, biodiversity studies, ecology, um, I think the question to ask is what research is not supported by uh, collections? Yes, I've used uh, the Strickland collection as well as other museums quite a lot. Um, there's a number of ways in which uh, uh, I've used it uh, for getting DNA off, uh, you know, a, a broken leg off a specimen, or um, uh, simply the data uh, from the, the collection. This is the physical evidence that can be kept for a couple of hundred years. That allows you to check up uh, uh, on that research and the name that somebody used. An informal uh, definition is simply there the physical evidence of uh, a specimen that was used in research that also uh, can be used to uh, simply connect the previous research to something somebody's doing in the future. Education and outreach is essential to museums because um, it allows people to connect with the sort of the real thing. And the real thing is very inspiring 
because uh, there you can you can sort of turn it around and look at it, and it becomes a three-dimensional uh, complete thing rather than a flat picture that uh, is the equivalent of something on a screen that's distant from you. Um, it's also very important to sort of lay out the diversity of, of things so that people can immediately compare them in, in ways that they can personalize. Insect conservation is uh, important because basically what you're doing is you're saying that something is disappearing or uh, something is changing. And really collections are one of the few time capsules or time machines that you can uh, uh, practically have um, in, in terms of going back and saying this was there, this was once common, this had a certain genetic profile or something like that. That uh, it, It's absolutely essential for uh, in, uh, clearly nailing down uh, the existence of something. Yes, we work with other museums a lot. Uh, it, it, we uh, send loans out and we obtain loans from other museums. We send them some of our material so there's a physical movement of specimens. Not so much these days because in fact we've got about a third of our one million specimens uh, sort of digitally uh, recorded the, the label data and often the images are recorded for those specimens and that allows you to put that information in a computer and allows somebody living in Timbuktu to uh, 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 compare your stuff and the, the uh, locations and assuming you've got your identification right, uh, compare them in a way that uh, uh, gives them a global sense of uh, distribution in time and space of those uh, specimens. So our data figures prominently and can be easily found in something called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, the GBIF. It also figures prominently in a, a big consortium uh, called Canadensis, which is uh, uh, university collections, uh, plants, um, birds, and especially also insects that uh, allow you to get a, a, a quick snapshot of the distribution of species um, and species lists all across can Canada. Yeah, my favorite, I have to admit, is the butterflies because um, but, but then after that it's like asking uh, somebody who has multiple children who their favorite child is. I can't do it. Um, I can say that the swallowtail butterflies have occupied my whole life and they're right there, for example. They're big and beautiful and elegant and mysterious and accessible and difficult, very difficult to collect, so that's why collections are so important. Hopefully by now, we'll have convinced you that insect collections are both fascinating and important. If you've been inspired to create your own insect collections, you'll be glad to know that this is a very simple process. In the next video, we will share with you some pro tips for creating and maintaining your own insect collection.